Well, good morning. Good morning. As you know, Dan Davis cannot be here this morning. And in the schedule of everything that is Che here, I need to let you know I have not had the time to prepare that I would normally like to prepare. But as we bring God's word this morning, just praying that as we open his word and we look at who Jesus is, that even in this time that we always proclaim him. So I don't have the same structure. I don't have a whole bunch of slides. I've got a couple. But I was really drawn as I prayed about this and thought through as uh, Dan had to make plans to go back to his church. Uh, just that we talk about what it is to draw near to God. And in opening with that hymn, the very first line, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. And I often observe in music, and it's not just exclusive to contemporary music, but it has been through hymnody through all the centuries. When we dare to cross this line of saying, he is friend. And... When we talk about the God of the entire universe, yet we sing in terms of such familiarity. If we think about God as the God of the entire universe, who merely spoke at the command of his words and all the earth was formed, all of the stars were put in place. He separated day and night. And by his voice, by the command of God's word, that he spoke and all of the creatures came to be and ultimately that he formed man and woman in his image the power of a god is creator and we dare to say that we know him and then we also think as we look towards this god that he revealed himself through the old testament and that we see how that he continued to reveal himself through fire, through plagues, through separating the Red Sea. And we go through and see all of these incredible stories of God even as a warrior. We see a God who has the command of the entire angelic force at his hand. And we dare to say we know him. And then we see a God that even in the disobedience of Israel, that through all of that time and their stubbornness against him, that as he kept on bringing his prophets to command his word, and to demonstrate that you're talking to the God of the entire universe and we dare to sing in terms and call him friend. It's a bold thing we do. And it's a bold thing we do as we gather to sing before our God. If you have your Bibles there with you, can you open to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That last verse is the one I want to keep coming back to. Let us then with confidence draw near. So I'm not trying to uh, derail or interfere with Pastor Dan's messages when he talks about courageous faith. But I do feel that there's a common line here as we look at this, what it means with confidence. As we look at religion, and the entire human race, as we think through what it means to encounter a God who is divine, holy, powerful, the real response should be fear and trembling because how dare we say that we know such a God? But since we have such a great high priest, given all those attributes of God, we dare to say we know him, we dare to sing before him. How can we know God except that he has made himself known to us? Without that, this word confidence, and as Pastor Dan continues to talk about courageous faith, to be before a God where we have fear and trembling because we are not worthy, because we know our innermost thoughts. We know the way that... Uh, we treat or think about other people. We know our lack of discipline. Or alternatively, 
we are working so hard to make ourselves worthy before such a God. And that striving, that continual battling, we start to see that it's in our own strength. To dare to say we know such a great God, but he has made himself known to us. Little us. And who are we that God would love us so much that he would send Jesus so that we could draw near to his throne? One of the interesting things as I look at Christian faith, and as we gather in this time of the church that we sing about Jesus, God's had a plan he has been revealing to his people that we see through the entirety of Scripture, from Genesis through to Revelation. And I love delving into the Old Testament. And when I was younger, I didn't do it as much. More of it was out of mystery and confusion because I don't know how it relates to today. And we look at the stories of Moses and how God was releasing Israel out of Egypt. We look at the structure of the temple and we look at the prophets and we look at the way they spoke and the way they spoke with the miraculous. And how did that apply to me as I gathered together with my friends and my family and my church on Sundays? One thing I've become more and more fascinated about as I look at Scripture is seeing how God has continued to reveal Himself through the different ages. And that before Jesus walked on the earth, He still showed a way to His people how they could draw near to His throne. And we think of the Old Testament, we think of it as judgment and separation. But God, by His grace, has continued to show a way that His people could draw near. Just brought up on this next slide, just a very brief sketch, just to think about your imagination. There's wonderful passages of Scripture I'm not going to delve into. But as you go through Scripture, you see such a detailed account about exactly how they should build the tabernacle. And that God gave a very detailed description to Moses. And even the details about how things were to be woven, how things were to be laid out. And God gave his people by his grace at that time a way that they could draw near to his throne. As we think about what it is to worship God, and we love to worship God in song. And that is a wonderful central thing about who we are at Chehi. But as God showed himself through the temple... It was to draw them near that they would encounter the very throne and presence of God. As God gave the instructions for the temple, as people would walk through the gate to the temple, the first thing they would encounter is this imposing high altar. And the first message that they would get as they approach the temple of God is that there is no worship without sacrifice. And as they come in through those gates and they're ushered into a time of worship, the first thing to be done is that there is a sacrifice on that high altar. And as they continued on past that high altar, halfway between there and the holy place is what is called the laver or a washbowl. Because as they're making sacrifice, sacrifice was messy. And we talk about the word sacrifice quite easily. As they talk about worship in the Old Testament, it was costly. They were farmers, it was agriculture. They needed to bring in animals to take their place. But even in that, the whole process of how the priest would work, even after the sacrifice, before they approached the holy place, there was this wash bowl, where even after the sacrifice, they would have to clean and wash their hands. But all of this is that they would approach and go into, at this time it was a tabernacle, that God would dwell with his people. Later on was built as elaborate temples that God gave the blessing that Solomon would build that temple. But as they would then approach and go towards the holy place, that tent you see towards the top left, having gone through the sacrifice and having gone through cleansing, they would approach the holy place. And in that holy place, as they continued to approach the throne of God, you've got a picture here where they would walk in and on the left you have the lampstand. You have these wonderful lights that are flickering around with a room that is laid with gold. And on that lampstand, there are buds. A lampstand that is giving life that is reminiscent of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. So as they walk into the holy place, they're walking into the very presence of God that man was designed that we as mankind, male and female, to dwell with God. 
and that he would tabernacle with us. And that's where it was in Genesis 2, before we look at uh, the first sin with Adam and Eve. The temple was to be a temporary illustration of that again. That while as mankind we don't have access to the tree of life because of sin, you walk into the tabernacle and there's a reminder. God's plan is that we would tabernacle. He would tabernacle with us. As you walk into the holy place, on the right hand side, there is a table of showbread. Whereas they go in there, the showbread to demonstrate God's provision and that He is the provider for His people. And one of the beautiful things with the showbread is that it is laid with frankincense and that the smell of oils. To go into worship in the temple was a sensory experience where the light flickering off of the gold and off of the curtains, but also even the smell of oils as they would go in there. That to walk into that place, kind of like walking into a garden and dwelling with your God. As you go further into the holy place, just before you get to this big curtain, they've got what is called the altar of incense. And that was a place where a priest would go up to that altar and would pray for all of God's people. And it was a place of intercessory prayer. And as you think about this temporary tabernacle, that when God gave the command for this, this was when Israel were wandering in the desert. And you've got a million people surrounded in camps of all the tribes of Israel surrounding this tabernacle. This tabernacle being in the center of it as God's instructions to the people of Israel to say, this is how I am showing you every day, every morning, every evening, how I have chosen to dwell with you and that you are my people. And that in the middle of that tent, the priest would go up to that altar of incense and pray for the entire nation that is surrounding that tent. But what's significant about that altar of incense is where the priest is. Because that priest at that altar of incense is behind, is just in front of that final curtain. Behind that curtain is the Ark of the Covenant. And that on that Ark of Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, that on top of that is a solid gold slab and statues of cherubim, of angels guarding the very presence of God that we could not dare to stand before. The priest is the other side of that curtain, the closest place without going into the Holy of Holies, praying on God's behalf and being the mediator to pray for all of God's people. So as we think what it was like to worship, we worship through song, which is a wonderful and beautiful thing. But when our imaginations can capture the way that God showed himself, that they would approach walking into his presence through sacrifice, through cleansing, and then into that image that's reminiscent of the Garden of Eden, of what it is like that God would choose to tabernacle with us, but ultimately looking towards his throne. Represented by the Ark of the Covenant as the footstool of God, where he would choose to reveal himself, even though it is veiled. Because to stand before the presence of a God of the entire universe, something that should be responded with fear and trembling, except that God has made it possible and revealed his way by his grace. If you think about that tabernacle that was established for Israel, as a way that God would show them daily His presence and that He is sufficient for them. And then we see through the history and the way it rolls out with Israel as Solomon then built the temple as a more permanent structure there uh, on Mount Zion, that everybody, even as they worship, they would look towards ascending the hill of the Lord and gathering before Him, that they would look up to that place, knowing that God was the center of who they were. We look through history, and as I mentioned that my interest in the Old Testament grew stronger, but it began with confusion because I didn't know how it related to who we are as Christians in knowing Jesus. Open your Bibles to Luke 2. In the very early account, as we look at the Christmas story, and as Jesus um, came in the form of mankind, and we read everything about the incarnation of Jesus Christ, one very brief story has really caught my heart in Luke chapter 2. When Jesus was very young, 
he was brought to the temple, as was the uh, Jewish tradition and uh, written in scripture that a child would be presented to the temple. When he was brought in, there was a man there by the name of Simeon. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. In that brief account, the Old Testament and the New Testament and everything that Jesus came to do, we see a faithful servant who was in the Old Testament tradition and faithful in his service around the temple, recognizing Jesus as Lord and Savior and the one who was being sent that we would have access to God. Jesus in the very form of the baby. I love Christmas time, especially for what it means in terms of all the music and the celebrations and the festivities of Christmas. But one thing I'm always conscious of at Christmas is Jesus came for a mission. And we look at the cross and everything that was uh, the ultimate um, work that God had to do through Jesus Christ. But that was only possible because Jesus became man. And that as he walked in the flesh that we could know God. And in everything with the temple, we see that God, by his grace in the temple, established himself in the camp, in the middle of all of the tribes, that they would be aware of his presence and that he would dwell among them. But then at this point here with Simeon, we see how God in the flesh dwelt among them more than in symbol, more than in just in ritual, but as a man who walked with his disciples and with his followers, that they would know the Father and that they could draw near to him. And that as he walked with them, especially for those three years of ministry before he went to the cross, that they would know him as friend. But what a friend. Jesus who was there at the very beginning of creation. Jesus who also, as the Father, has the command of the entire angelic force at his hand. As we picture Jesus, for him to choose to tabernacle with us and to be that kind of friend. So the reason I felt drawn towards talking about this and what it means to draw near to God and the fact that he has demonstrated through his temple how to do it, as Jesus came in the flesh, there is no longer any need for the temple. Because as Jesus came and walked in the flesh, that the body of Christ would be his church and his people. Not restricted to a building, but that the actual building blocks be the individuals he has called and equipped that they would be his church and his body. I do love the Old Testament imagery because I'm a very visual person and, and the whole idea of imagining what that was like with the, the, the glittering metal. One thing about the temple that I've uh, loved and learned is how the metals that are given in scripture, and check this out at some point, the pre metals become more precious the closer you get to the very throne room of God. The high altar, as you enter the gate at the east, is laid with bronze. And then as you get closer, there is silver. And then there is gold that is just on the you know, decorative gold, but it's not solid gold. When you get to the Ark of the Covenant, it is solid gold on the top, on the mercy seat, the top of the Ark of the Covenant that covers his presence. So you see what it is to be that which is seen as more precious, drawing towards the very presence of God. My imagination gets excited about that kind of imagery and uh, we can't see the temple. We can do charcoal sketches and that kind of thing and try and gather from scripture. 
But I think it's exciting as we look at the Old Testament and there was a way he tangibly demonstrated his presence. Jesus walked in the flesh. The disciples knew him as a brother. And that not just to the 12 or the three that were closest to him, but the 70 and then the multitudes and those that he preached to that he would even give through his parables. Ways that they, even through day-to-day -day truths, day-to-day -day examples, would know God as king. And what it is that even as citizens of Israel, truly their citizenship and their identity is as citizens of the Most High King. In Hebrews chapter 3, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This is something that is good to boast in. As we gather together and as we pray and as we seek out God together, in our times of prayer, God does care about the smallest of things in our lives. And the fact that we can boldly approach Him because we don't go through a system where we go through priests where we are waiting for a priest at the altar of incense there in the temple. But as Jesus went to the cross, as Jesus came as a baby, Simeon recognized who he was. We know that 33 years later, as he was taken to the cross, and he paid the price on the cross that was for our sin. In that temple, at that moment, as Jesus declared, it is finished. The price is paid. The wrath of God is satisfied. This big, huge curtain that was the barrier between the altar of incense and the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, was ripped in two. A curtain that was so thickly woven that it couldn't be ripped by human hands. But one of the most startling verses in the account of Jesus' crucifixion is that addressing that that curtain was torn in two. And then with Jesus paying that price before God and satisfying the debt that was ours because of sin, that God would remove that barrier. And as God had revealed himself through the Old Testament that he would very obviously dwell amongst a million plus people, now in the person of Jesus Christ, as he satisfied the price for our sin, God will remove that barrier forever. And it doesn't mean the temple is irrelevant because it was, a very, it was so specifically laid out by God in His plan, but it was the way in that time He showed His people how they could draw near to Him in confidence. And He both revealed Himself as well as concealed the depth of His power as well as the preciousness of the most holy place. But in the person of Jesus Christ, because of that debt being paid and that curtain in the most holy place being torn in two, we don't go through a priest at the altar of incense. But as we pray towards our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, much more than a friend that we can confide in, a friend that we can lay our burdens down or share in our joys, but our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who He Himself is the High Priest. And as He satisfied that debt, not only did He satisfy that debt and the curtain was torn in two, but He had victory over death itself. 
And in those words that Jesus said that he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. All of our churches are different. I know that as I talk with all of you that we've got different traditions, different approaches in the way we take our order of service, and definitely different structures. God did not give a command in his Bible to say that your church shall have, this space will be here by 10 feet by 12 feet and do not get it wrong. <laughs> and these are the images that you must have in your curtains. But the church is drawn together by the person of Jesus Christ. Christ is faithful over God's house. We are his house. And if indeed we hold fast our confidence, how dare we approach a God of the entire universe? How dare we call him friend? But as Jesus has made himself the greatest of friends, that he would lay his life down for us. What a friend for sinners. So as we go into this week, and as you go into your music making, I've had this theme word of identity through each week. What it means to truly know our identity in Jesus Christ. And that if apart from the grace of Jesus Christ, before a holy God, fear and trembling, makes sense. But for a Savior who has paid the price for us, that he stands at the right hand of God the Father and says, I've satisfied that debt that we can call him friend and we can boast in a hope that is not empty wishes but a hope that is a firm confidence because if we see this word of God as truth and as promises of a God who is sufficient for all we can draw near to that throne and we can walk that daily let me pray for you all Lord, in so many ways as we walk this Christian walk, to pray to a God and to pray to a friend, and what a friend you are, but without having you physically present, Lord, what a mystery it is in terms of knowing how you had satisfied that price for us and made it possible that we could know the Father. May we cling to your word and even all the mystery and all of the incredible ways you have tangibly shown yourself through history. May we know you as that same God of the miraculous, the God who is the warrior, who is just, who is sufficient, but also that you are the same God that as you spoke before the people when they were hungry after your preaching, that you made it possible that they could eat just from those few loaves and fishes, that you would make it possible that you would tabernacle with us in the flesh. So Lord, even as we pray to you and as we go on to the day that everything would be a musical offering before our God, we would truly boast in the confidence and be courageous because we know we serve a God who is all powerful and that we dare to praise you because you Remove that barrier. The veil was torn. That we can boldly praise in the name of Jesus. And that you would continue to work in us and sanctify us. That we would be made more and more like you. Lord, give us that boldness. Draw us towards your throne, we pray. Amen.